Hello and welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Daniel Hurst and I'm a freelance journalist. Um, we're joined here today by Mr. Tetsuo Kotani. He's an associate professor at Meikai University and a senior fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs. Um, uh, in the last few weeks, it's been quite a roller coaster with uh, developments related to North Korea. Last week, President Trump cancelled his planned summit for June 12th in Singapore, only to revive the prospect a day later. Um, a close watcher of these issues and a person who's been in touch with officials in the Trump administration, um, Mr. Contani is here to share his expertise. Um, before we get started, I'd like you to all turn your mobile phones to silent mode, uh, and uh, because it's late in the day, we'll get straight to it. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, it's nice to be back here uh, for the second time. And um, I, I know I'm expected to talk about the, the prospect for the US DPRK summit meeting, but uh, I'm just giving up the, uh, uh, you know, predict, predicting the upcoming summit because every few hours, you know, the things rapidly change. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm right, but sometimes I'm wrong whenever I make prediction. So uh, rather than making a prediction for the short term, uh, let me give you a bigger picture of uh, what's going on. And let me begin with uh, the question of why DPRK changed its uh, stance at the turn of this year. Some people say it's because of the economic sanction. Sanction is working. And some people say it's because of the uh, US military pressure. Uh, because of that military pressure, uh, DPRK is now seeking a, a better relations with the United States. And some people say, no, no, no. Uh, the sanctions or military option, military pressure uh, didn't work. Actually, this was a long planned strategy by the DPRK. And my sense is that, uh, yes, the sanction uh, should have certain influence on the change of the DPRK's behavior. But I think the main reason is uh, DPRK had a long term strategy. And th they are just implementing this long term strategy. Uh, if you remember, in July 2016, the DPRK government made a statement about the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And in that statement, uh, DPRK clearly defined what does uh, the de uh, denuclearization of the peninsula means. And, and then they uh, also advocated the talks with the US. And uh, uh, at the same time, I, uh, I heard a story about a North Korean diplomat who attended a, a track to uh, conference in Beijing. This diplomat stated that the DPRK would never give up what they had, but uh, their future capabilities can be negotiable. And when they, uh, when DPRK uh, give up all the nuclear weapons, is when the global zero or the world without nuclear weapons is achieved. So, uh, looking at those past statements, I think DPRK uh, is basically implementing this uh, long-term strategy or policy. So. The question is whether or not the DPRK will ultimately give up its nuclear weapons. Uh, I think it's yes. But uh, as I said, you know, other countries also need to give up the nuclear weapons uh, in order to make DPRK give up its nuclear weapons. So basically, I think what uh, DPRK is seeking is an arms control with the United States. And I think we have to remember that. Um, and we all know the US position is totally different from the DPRK's position with regard to the denuclearization. 
uh, U.S. is demanding the CBID, complete, uh, verifiable, uh, irrevers irreversible de denuclearization of North Korea. Uh, while the BRK is actually demanding CBIG, complete, uh, verifiable, irre irreversible guarantee of the regime. So their positions are almost totally opposite. And in order to make a deal uh, in the uh, upcoming or a possible summit, you know, the each side needs to make concessions. And I, I, and I wonder whether uh, US or DPRK can make any concession. Um, but I, I'm a little bit optimistic on this point because, yes, the U.S. National Security Advisor refers to uh, Libya, Libya model for the CBID. But if you look at actual denuclearization process of Libya, it was very much gradual and step-by-step -step approach. Uh, the, the Libyan model actually started in 2003, and after nine months of secret negotiation between Libyan official and the UK and the US officials, the, the end of 2003, Libya, Libyan government officially announced uh, its intention to denuclearize. And uh, two, three months after that official uh, announcement, uh, there was a, a initial step for the uh, denuclearization, meaning the U.S. military airlifted the Libyan nuclear capabilities out of the country into uh, the Tennessee. And following that, uh, the United States started take, to take a step-by-step -step, uh, normalization process with Libya which very much satisfied Libyan demand. And uh, after nine months, the United States stated that the denuclearization of Libya was essentially completed. Then the United States lifted the sanctions vis-a-vis uh, -vis Libya. And one year and a half after, the United States completed the normalization with Libya. So actual Libyan model was very much gradual and step-by-step -step approach. And I think um, DP, DPRK denuclearization needs to be gradual and step-by-step -step, uh, too. And the very big difference between Libya and DPRK is DPRK is, whether you like it or not, is a quasi-nuclear weapon state. When Libya didn't succeed in developing nuclear weapons, so the scale of the process should be very different. And I don't think the denuclearization of DPRK can be completed within a year or two. I think it would take many years. So. Naturally, we need a gradual step to do so. Um, but on the other hand, we are still not 100% uh, sure what the DPRK is trying to take from this process. Well, we can think of uh, DPRK will demand, for example, the, the shrinking or even the withdrawal of the U.S. forces Korea, or uh, DPRK may request the termination of the U.S. ROK alliance, or at least the nuclear umbrella commitment. And uh, we can uh, expect DPRK would seek a, a peace treaty or uh, the normalization with the United States, and perhaps the economic sanction lifting plus economic uh, uh, financial support from the international society. 
Um, but uh, I think, you know, in, in regardless of which uh, process uh, we will take, I think the, the basic philosophy of the DPRK uh, denuclearization would be different from the U.S.-Russian model. U.S.-Russian model of the uh, arms control was the trust but verify. But with regard to the DPRK, we have no trust in DPRK. So perhaps our philosophy would be don't trust and verify. Uh, but uh, uh, with regard to the verification, not only the verification of uh, DPRK's nuclear or other WMD capabilities, I think the DPRK would uh, demand the verification of U.S. capabilities in and around uh, South Korea, uh, which uh, I think we have to accept in order to proceed uh, on this uh, agenda. Um, so, I think uh, uh, the process will continue, and the question is whether we can actually see the summit meeting on June 12th. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I don't, I don't predict. But I think the chances are now becoming very high, uh, and it's now up to how uh, Mr. Trump will respond to the personal letter from Mr. Kim Jong-un uh, tonight. And you know, last night, I, I, I woke up very early to listen to the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's speech. So I have been spending uh, sleepless nights, but I think I have to wake up very early uh, tomorrow again to, to listen to the, Mr. Trump's uh, response. And finally, let me say a few words about Japanese uh, position. Um, you know, some people say Japan has been uh, left out throughout this process. Uh, but uh, I, I have different uh, perception. You know, if you look at the uh, Mr. Abe and, and Mr. Trump's summit meeting in April. Yes, there was a um, very deep concern about Japan being left out. But uh, ac actually, Mr. Trump's commitment to the Japanese concerns, meaning the uh, chemical, biological weapons, shorter range ballistic missiles, and abduction issue, in fact, Mr. Trump showed very strong uh, commitment to those Japanese uh, concerns, perhaps more than expected. So I would say, um, the, although Jap Japan is not, you know, definitely Japan is not in the driver's seat, and Japan is not in the passenger seat, maybe we are sitting in the back seat, but I think uh, because of this close U.S.-Japan coordination and uh, close relationship between Mr. Abe and Mr. Trump, uh, Japan is not uh, actually left out. And I would describe Jap Japanese position uh, after March is cautiously pessimistic. And the U.S. cautiously optimistic and South Korea positively optimistic. So there's a, a expectation gap among the three countries. But um, I think the Japanese position should be just continue this cautiously uh, pessimistic approach in order to avoid any uh, mistakes uh, we have made in the past. Um, and as I said, Japan is not in the driver's seat, of course not. But uh, we need a clear principle to deal with uh, this issue, uh, to analyze this process. And I think the, the principle would be provided by our, I mean, the Japan 
DPRK 2002 Pyongyang Declaration, which was a very comprehensive agreement. The, uh, this Pyongyang Declaration covers nuclear issue, WMD issue, abduction issue, and also the normalization issue, and the economic assistance issue. So as long as we uh, stick to this Pyongyang Declaration, I think uh, we can, we can uh, expect a time to, to, to take a chance to implement this Pyongyang uh, Declaration. So uh, perhaps that's all I have now, and I'll take any comment or question. Thank you very much for your talk. Now we've got plenty of time for questions, but um, please try and limit your questions to one question each. Uh, and if we have time, we'll come back back around. Um, and when you uh, please introduce your name and your affiliation. So first of all, questions from journalists. Any questions? Thank you. My name is Patrick Welte, German newspaper, Frankfurter Allgemeine. When you talk about that North Korea wishes a guarantee for the regime and for the, uh, yeah, for the sovereignty of its country, how could such a guarantee be given? And I wonder especially if you think about economic aid opening up the country, or if Mr. Kim thinks about opening up the country a little bit on the economic side. Wouldn't that undermine any political guarantee you give to the regime? Thank you very much. Um, so I think what uh, Washington and Pyongyang are doing at this moment is to understand the, each other's uh, requirement for the successful summit. And as I said, we are still not sure what, what is Pyongyang's requirement for the you know, guarantee of the, the regime. And you know, one thing I can say is you know, w one of the primary reasons why DPRK has been rejecting the Libyan model is you know, the, the Bush administration started this uh, denuclearization process and normalization process. But actually, the Obama administration decided to intervene after the Arab, Arab Spring. So one thing DPRK has to worry is the, the uh, uh, consistency uh, policy uh, of the United States. So I, I would uh, imagine uh, DPRK cannot be reassured unless there's a certain uh, agreement or a guarantee that the, even if the administration changes in the US, the, the commitment to the, security, the regime's uh, guarantee sh should be uh, maintained. And on the economic issue, uh, in fact, uh, the Trump administration has been referring to the possible economic support. But uh, DPRK is rejecting uh, on this point. So uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, you know, DPRK needs to be cautious about the opening up its economy. So uh, uh, that's, that's one thing. That's another thing I think we have to uh, take into account. So just follow that one up. Um, uh, for, it to survive, for an agreement to survive administrations, how, how could that actually practically be given? Would it have to go to Congress, do you think? I think uh, the Congress should play a greater, greater role uh, on this. Uh, so by, by making a treaty, inter international law, uh, I think DPRK should be more reassured. Okay. Next question. Just first to follow up, I mean, how can Trump uh, guarantee Mr. Kim's security from inside, and if he opens up the country, uh, there will be a risk from inside as well. But my, I have a different question. Um, I'm very surprised about what you say about Trump's commitment for Japan. I mean, uh, Trump has thrown Mr. Abe under the bus like five times by now, I think, uh, with the tariffs uh, as the last point. And uh, 
Mr. Tanaka Hitoshi, who is probably more uh, uh, more competent to talk about uh, negotiations uh, with North Korea than anybody else in Japan. He said on Wednesday, it's Hatsugashi that Mr. Abe goes to Trump to talk about the abductees. Now the question of the abductees, if you want something, and obviously Mr. Abe wants to bring abductees back, if they're abductees uh, still alive, then you have to give something. Mr. Abe has the most bellicose language against North Korea of all heads of state, um, of all prime ministers. Um, at the same time, either he says, I want to get them back, and he does something, or he believes they are not alive anymore, and then he can talk like that. Otherwise, this is a, a, a major contradiction. Can you explain that? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, on that uh, first uh, point, um, yes, it's, it's very difficult for a foreign state, state to guarantee other countries' uh, regime survival. So all the US can do is at least there will be no intervention uh, from outside, and inside, you know, of course, we we, we cannot guarantee uh, no guarantee of the security. And on the uh, abduction issue, um, I think the what the Prime Minister Abe is expecting is at least raise this issue uh, with uh, Kim Jong Un when they meet, and. Uh, the possible reaction from Kim Jong Un is, you know, this is this is an issue between Japan and the DPRK, so don't don't mention it. Um, but uh, if Mr. Trump uh, doesn't back off, and Mr. Trump, if, if if he says, you know, you have to raise, you have to deal with this issue with Japanese, I think that would be a big plus for Japan. And uh, uh, but uh, the difficult the challenge for Japan is we haven't defined what 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 is the 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 resolution of that of this abduction issue means whether it's uh, you know to total disclosure of the issue or whether it's a, a return of some people alive. And I don't think there's any consensus here in Japan. So I think uh, we have to do it first before we prepare for a summit meeting with, with Kim Jong-un. Next question. Go for it. Hi, my name is Claire Hewitt. Um, I'm coming from the U.S. Embassy. I was going to ask, well, thank you, Juan, for your talk, but you mentioned the U.S.-Russia model, and I feel like another very big divergence there is that it was Reagan and Gorbachev, and that relationship is inherently different than Trump and Kim. So how do you think those personalities play? How do you think interpersonal relationships are going to play at the summit itself? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, of course, the personalities uh, really matter here. Um, and uh, in the case of uh, Trump and Kim, you know, although Mr. Trump calls himself as a as a deal maker, but actually he's a deal breaker. And I I, I cannot think of any deal he has made after his inauguration. He has broken. TPP, Paris Accord, and uh, you now the NAFTA, uh, I, JCPOA. But uh, I, I cannot think of any deal he has made. And in the case of Kim Jong un, yes, he is also a deal breaker. So I, I just wonder whether a deal can be made by two deal breakers. Uh, so, so as I said, you know, first of all, we have to. We, I mean, we, we have to start with this, this don't trust. But if we have to verify the each other, each other's intention to build confidence. 
And without such a confidence, we, I don't think we can make any deal, and we, we cannot realize a normalization. And uh, in the case of US and Russia, uh, of course, the Mr. Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev's personalities mattered, but overall, US-Soviet relations, there was certain confidence, at least in terms of arms control. But the situation is totally different between the US and DPRK. Any other questions? Feel free. What do you think? I mean, I understand that you don't like to make predictions, but what do you think what's going to happen if this summit meeting is going to happen, but it's not going to end well? And they go and leave Singapore, and there will be no solution, and there won't be further summit meetings afterwards. Well, I, th I think uh, the Trump administration is already trying to, to lower the expectation of the first meeting, uh, I mean the upcoming meeting. You know, Mr. Trump himself already stated the, the, the meeting may be extended or even postponed, or he may have to take uh, multiple meetings. So I think he is tr trying to lower the expectation. Um, but uh, my, my sense is that at least the Washington and Pyongyang would try to make a short-term visible achievement. Otherwise, the, the process uh, would be end. So uh, to, to maintain the momentum for this entire process, I think both sides would try to make compromises to create a certain visible outcomes, uh, which, which I just cannot uh, predict. <laughs> I mean, I cannot say what would be the final outcome, but uh, I think that at least they will try to realize something visible. Um, even if not, uh, I, I don't think we will return to the last two years situation immediately. The, the atmosphere is now completely different. And you know, South Korea, China, Russia, uh, at least uh, don't, don't prefer the, the high, high tension, high military tension in the Korean Peninsula. And even, even the United States, I think it's very difficult to, to create such a, a high tension. So um, I think even if the summit fails, um, there should be a certain room for, for uh, further Further negotiation. So, do you not see uh, any prospect of uh, the maximum pressure campaign reverting to that? That there's no, there's not the same political will now, given the the dialogues that, that's been happening with China and South Korea and Russia. That there's not the political will anymore to go back to that maximum pressure campaign. So, the uh, U.S. may try to take a uni take a unilateral maximum pressure campaign, but uh, I don't, I don't think. Uh, first of all, South Korea would agree on uh, a massive uh, combined joint exercise with the United States to pressure DPRK. <coughs> and also, it would be very difficult to, to get approval from, uh, I mean, uh, get the consent from China and Russia on UN sanctions. So um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see a uh, in the last year's situation coming back. Any further questions? Uh, since there aren't any others at the moment, we'll go back to you. And um, it's open to anyone for questions now. You said correctly, uh, this has been coming for quite a while, since 2016 at least. I mean, Kim Jong-un, ever since he became uh, the leader of North Korea, has been moving away from his father Song-un politics. Uh, 
and now he's even got away from from uh, Byung Jin, so uh, uh, which was uh, he's basically abandoned the, the development of, of uh, weapons of mass destructions, at least in his rhetoric. Now, first you called him a deal breaker. Uh, to what extent? Why, why do you call him a deal breaker? Uh, what he, he has he needed some time to get into. In to, to, to consolidate his power. But since then, he seems to, do, to follow a, a relatively a clear path. He has moved the power from the military to the party, which is a huge uh, change inside North Korea. Maybe you can address these changes inside North Korea for a bit, especially as well uh, thinking of the young generation of the elite, to whom he obviously feels responsible. Um, well, um, I'm sorry, I'm not uh, uh, familiar with the DPRK's, you know, internal politics too much. So perhaps all I can say is, uh, yes, uh, the power consolidation is very important f uh, for the countries like DPRK to change its directions dramatically. So uh, I think the the recent change in DPRK's behavior reflects the Kim Jong-un's power is strong at this moment. So, uh, in a way, uh, whatever uh, we, we take vis-a-vis -vis the, the DPRK, um, I think we have to uh, consider our policies which doesn't undermine his his internal uh, position. I think that's very important. Please. Hi, Linda Sieg with Reuters. Um, returning to your comment that uh, you were uh, uh, fairly certain that the Trump administration was taking uh, Japan's concerns uh, very seriously and was actually committed to, you know, uh, making sure they're taking into account, including um, not only other weapons of mass destruction but the shorter range missiles. Um, I know that that has been the public's stance of uh, the Trump administration in the statements issued after meetings with Trump. Uh, but why are you so sure that they really mean it? There does seem to be doubt, even in the U.S., um, that Trump will, especially looking ahead to the uh, November congressional elections, uh, be <coughs> uh, tempted to make a deal that only focuses on ICBMs and not address Japan's concerns. So I'm just wondering why you're, uh, why you're sure of that and, and also why, given that uh, President Trump doesn't seem to worry too much about Japan's concerns on trade issues, why is he taking Japan's concerns on the security issue so seriously? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let me, let me answer uh, this way. You know, first of all, you know, as I said, I think this uh, entire process takes time, and uh, the the dismantlement of DPRK's WMD and also the missile capabilities is a uh, is a long term issue, long term objective. So I think at least the Japan and the United States share this as a long-term objective. So for the short term, U.S. may uh, prefer uh, certain compromise, particularly the ICBM. Um, but uh, even, even if the Trump administration takes this ICBM as a, as a bargaining tip, um, but uh, I think it's, it just frees the current situation. You know, we have been under the North Korean missile threat for more than 25 years, but we, we lived. And we lived because of the deterrence and because of the U.S. extent deterrence. So as, as long as DPR, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, as long as U.S. extended deterrence is credible, and as long as Japan continues to uh, uh, continues to make its effort to defend itself, 
I think we can, we can, uh, we will be okay for the short term. Uh, and as long as we maintain the the CBID as a long term objective together, so I, I don't I don't think we have to worry too much. And the the difference between security and trade is you know we don't we don't share the basic interest on this. Uh, you know, the U.S. has America first, and we are trying to promote the free trade. So there's a huge huge gap in our interest. So naturally, uh, on trade, we, we have to take a different uh, approaches. But if they make a deal that just deals with ICBMs first, won't it be seen as, as a massive blow to Japan? If from a political point of view, that it's like a snub? Um, perhaps the military experts, defense experts, don't worry too much. But uh, I, I would say, um, you know, the general public, media, may may show certain uh, anxiety about it. But uh, it, it's our, our job to reassure the general public that you know we, we don't have to worry too much. Okay. Next question. Uh, Nicholas Smith, you say, what am I missing here? Um, you, the, the US seems to be at maximum sanction at the moment, and probably the only thing they can do is, is move to, uh, I don't know, military action which would have excessive uh, collateral damage. The Chinese, you say, don't want the situation any worse, but they're perfectly happy for it to be quite bad um, just to, to, uh, to needle the US. Um, and potentially they might be open for uh, helping out North Korea a little bit more. So we seem to be at uh, impasse, don't we? Um, so, I, I think, uh, you know, what, what we have to expect after this summit, after this possible summit, is some countries will try to uh, lift their own sanctions, particularly the South Korea, and China, and perhaps Russia. And the Japan and the United States would be the last one to do so. But uh, if South Korea, China lift up its sanctions, that would be very much good plus for DPRK. And that might uh, offset the, uh, the pressure, pressure campaign. But that's something we have to accept in order to proceed this long process. And in the case of Libya too, the you know, other countries except the United States lifted sanction very early. But the US maintained its own sanction until the very uh, last end. So uh, this is something I think we, we have to accept. And but under such an environment, um, the, the negotiation needs to be done. <laughs> yeah. Um, Libya wasn't within artillery range of, uh, of a massive uh, megalopolis. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, but uh, it, it's it's almost impossible to to keep a unity of a maximum campaign, maximum pressure campaign. Um, that, that's, that's a reality we have to accept. So, you know, perhaps w all, the only thing we can do is just uh, uh, the, con you know, countries, the like-minded countries keep those maximum pressure and, and, and continue the negotiation with the DPRK for the denuclearization. Next question. You haven't yet. So go on. Hi, I'm Walter Sim from the Straits Times in Singapore. Um, assuming that the assuming that I mean we have painted quite a bleak picture of what's going to happen on June 12. Both parties are kind of at odds with each other. There's an impasse as we have established. Um, so. 
and you've also talked about how Japan is in the back seat. Do you think that Abe should take the initiative? When should he reach out for talks with Kim Jong Un? When would it be a good idea? Thank you. Well, it all depends on what will be the outcome of the summit between Trump and Kim first. And depending on the outcome, um, I think we will, the, the Japanese government will consider how, how to approach the DPRK. And at this moment, all we can do is just uh, think of the many scenarios. And uh, as I said, in, in the meantime, we have to define what is, what is our, our goal, our definition of the re resolution of this abduction issue. Uh, otherwise, we cannot uh, negotiate with the TPRK. Next question. Okay, Patrick Welter again. Uh, could you talk about what is your impression, what is the role of South Korea playing in the whole process right now? You said that this is the long-term strategy by DPRK. On the other hand, if you, if you see how President Moon is trying to celebrate that he brought all, the, all sides together and that he brought the peace process forward in South Korea, uh, on the peninsula, how does that, um, how to reconcile these both ideas? And related to that, assume that the summit brings some kind of resolution and that there will be a further approachment, a rapprochement between South Korea and DPRK. What would that mean for the Korean-Japanese relationship, political relationships? Wouldn't that make it pretty much harder for Japan to make a deal with DPRK concerning the abductees? Well, um, I think uh, the, the maximum pressure campaign actually worked on South Korea rather than North Korea, and particularly the, the military pressure uh, influenced Moon Jae-in government's approach to the DPRK. And, uh, from, from DPRK's point of view, the Moon Jae-in government is, uh, is a treasure. You know, he, he, Moon Jae-in is willing to talk to uh, North Korea, and he has four years to go. So uh, from DPRK's point of view, Moon Jae-in government is an ideal South Korean counterpart. And I think Kim Jong-un is utilizing South Korea, South Korea as a mediator for the U.S. DPRK summit meeting. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't think DPRK is really trusting South Korea. I think DPRK is just using South Korea. Uh, so now that the you know, Trump is now in a driving seat, and perhaps Moon Jae-in is passenger seat, back seat, I don't know. Together. <laughs> Together with Abe, <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, but uh, I think the South Korean uh, influence on the bilateral, I mean the US DPRK summit, or bilateral process would be uh, decreased. But on, on the other hand, I think this on separate, uh, separately, I think uh, no South uh, engagement, which has continued. And, and uh, you know, uh, your, your, your second question, you know, there was already a report that the DPRK demanded South Korea to give up the, the GSOMIA, the military secrecy sharing agreement with Japan. And I think uh, if Moon Jae-in government accepts it, uh, that would be an indication that the future Japan-South Korea military defense cooperation would be very, very difficult. And also we have to, you know, from Japanese point of view, we are wondering what will happen to the US forces Korea after uh, this process. And naturally, 
not, you know, one of the outcomes we can expect is now that the tension on the Korean Peninsula is, is reduced or gone, why, why South Korea needs to keep the U.S. forces? And, but from, from our perspective, U.S. presence on Korean, Korean Peninsula is very important. So that, that would be another issue uh, we, we, we may face in coming months or coming years. Next question. Anyone have a question that hasn't asked a question yet? Feel free. Any takers? All right, I might ask. Um, uh, human rights. Um, we've talked a bit about the abduction issue, but the rights of people within North Korea itself. Um, there hasn't been much focus on that publicly in the last few weeks. Is it something that you think Trump should raise? How could it be raised? Do you think that it's being downgraded so they deal with the security issue first? Any reflections on that? Well, I think uh, the Trump ad administration is very much committed to the human rights issues in Korea. Uh, as we remember the, the January Union of States the speech, he brought the, the North Korean defectors to the Congress and he raised this human rights issue, and he condemned North Korean human rights violation. Uh, and uh, similarly, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Trump met the families of Japanese abductees. So I, I see a certain uh, consistency on this point, and I, I, uh, and I know some people in the administration uh, very much committed to, to this issue. So in, in that sense, I think the definitely the human rights issues is uh, uh, one of the agenda for the upcoming summit. But when push comes to shove, do you think that the security issue will be prioritized by the US? They might raise human rights, but it's not really going to be part of the deal. Um, I think the, sh the security would be, of course, a priority short-term priority, but I, I, don't, I don't believe the U.S. will give up this human rights issue uh, for, the, for the long term. Okay. Feel free. Go ahead. Can I just uh, clarify the position on uh, intermediate-range uh, missiles? Uh, so obviously what the U.S. cares about is missiles don't get to the U.S. What Japan cares about is the, the intermediate range ones that uh, uh, bring Japan within, um, within range. Um, just how strong is, uh, is Trump's uh, commitment to, um, uh, to making sure that the um, North Korea get rid of um, intermediate range missiles? Um, I cannot speak for Mr. Trump himself. Uh, but uh, my, my conversation with the administ administration staff indicates they, they are very much uh, worried about the capabilities. Uh, you know, the U.S. has forces in Japan and Korea. So, and basically, DPRK's missiles are targeting at the U.S. bases rather than the Japanese or Korean cities. So uh, I, I think the, of course, the ICBM might be the primary concern for the United States, but uh, I, don't, I don't think they will be okay with the uh, IRBM or short range missiles you know, remaining in, in DPRK's arsenal. Are there any other questions? This is your last chance. All right. Well, I think we're pretty much at the end. I would ask. I would ask one final one. What do you see as the minimum? Um, uh, this is not asking you to speculate about what the summit would achieve, but what would you see as the minimum successful outcome? As in, if it's just a deal with a with a, a vague goal of denuclearisation, uh, but it only includes a commitment to letting international inspectors to, to check what the state of the current nuclear capability is. Could that be a success or is that, un is that not enough? I think uh, the, at the minimum 
requirement for success is DPRK's uh, consent on the disclosure of its entire WMD program and, and uh, uh, willingness to accept verification. The, that would be the minimum requirement. Uh, otherwise, uh, I, I, don't, I don't call it a success. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending today. And this is your second time here at the FCCJ, but the last one was a couple of years ago. So we have here to present to you a 12-month honorary membership. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for attending.